Good afternoon. Howell to the library for the gathering of the groups. He will discuss his graphic memoir about Representative John Lewis, March, which was the winner of the 2016 National Book Award. And for fans of historical fiction, we will be hosting Becky Marietta on Wednesday, September 29th. Her book, White River Red, is set during Prohibition about real life Arkansan Forestina Bradley Campbell. For today's event, I am delighted to have Sydney Thompson with us. Sydney is the author of Follow the Angels, Follow the Doves, which was selected as an Arkansas gem in 2020 and was a finalist for the 2021 Oklahoma Book Award in Fiction and the Spur Award for his. Both books are part of the Bass Reeves Trilogy. Thompson holds a PhD in American Literature and African American Narratives from the University of North Texas and an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Arkansas. He teaches Creative Writing and African American Literature at Texas Christian University in Fort, Fort Worth and is currently at work on his third novel in the trilogy and we will have the first two available for sale following the program. Please help me welcome Sydney Thompson. All right. Seems very dramatic. Um, thank you so much for today. It's a wonderful honor to return to my old hometown. I love living here in Fayetteville. Love the people, Skip, Derek, and others I may know, but I can't really tell maybe, you know, with the mask on, but thank you, thank you all for, I'm sorry? Absolutely, sorry, I will. So, thank you. I'm here to talk about Bass Reeves, and before I speak, I thought let's reverse it a little bit um, and do a slight q and I, I want to ask a question. How much do you know about Bass Reeves? What, what do you know? Is it zero? Is it, well, a little bit? Um, a lot? Some? Some? Is there, is there anyone in here who has never heard of him until the program today? Okay. <clears throat> so our best guess is this is his final resting place. Bass Reeves, born in 1838, died in 1910. He's considered the most successful, most feared lawman of his day with a and David, didn't mention you earlier, of you, of course. Um, he was a lawman for 32 years when it was extremely rare. He was one of the, for a, an African American to be a lawman at that time for Judge Isaac Parker in his court in Fort Smith. But he had a career for 32 years, which Etc. All right, so he's buried in this somewhat potter's field, you could say, Peter's Chapel Cemetery outside of Muskogee, Oklahoma. Um, the Shelby Foot of Bass Reeves history is Art Burton. He wrote a book called Black Gun, Silver Star. So. I'm going to take him at his word when he said, this is our best guess at where he lies. We're not sure where, but this is the, this is the cemetery.
there's the sign right on this little modest road running outside of Muskogee. Let's see. Statue, of course, right, in Fort Smith. Got to meet one of the sponsors for this statue uh, yesterday in Fort Smith. He couldn't believe someone was writing a book. He said, finally, somebody's writing a story about his life. Art Burton wrote a wonderful book, Black Gun, Silver Star, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, but it's, it's, it's nonfiction. It's very scholarly. It's a wonderful, wonderful treasure trove for someone like me to play with, to dig in and court testimonies, old newspaper clippings, interviews of marshals, family members. Uh, it's a treasure trove of information, but there's not a narrative. And um, And this is a picture of Bass Reeves himself. Very distinguished, handsome man. Big bushy mustache. So how did I find out about uh, Bass Reeves? CNN, at the end of, uh, always a big fan of Morgan Freeman. And at the end of the interview, he was asked, what would your dream role be? And he said, Bass Reeves. You ain't hear a lot of stuff about Bass Reeves. I love how he was slipping into character as he was just thinking of the man. And that was maybe part of why I wanted to slip into that character as well. Nobody's ever tackled him. He was one of the most well-known deputy marshals in the West in his time. I want to do Bass Reeves. Uh, I thought, well, my curiosity. I found a couple of books online, and that was it, like legitimate books. Um, Art Burton's book I've already mentioned, and then there was a, a really short uh, biography, novels, biography of, um, for, for kids, young adults, that doesn't really resemble his life much outside of a few facts tossed in. But So I just wanted to kind of join in this and try to share something about his life, tell his story as a narrative so that we can actually appreciate the facts that, you, that we, we can read about and know about, but they're so extraordinary that so romantically heroic that they're, they're almost hard to believe. And I, I was in workshop at University of North Texas for my, for my PhD, and my classmates would say, you know, I, I love the writing, I like, I love the character, but come on, f really? <laughs> and, and the more I was writing about his, his life at his peak as a lawman, um, because he was only injured once in 32 years, despite close, point blank, close range gunfights, et cetera. Um, I realized I needed more backstory to help us understand how in the world someone who's born a slave could escape that kind of torturous environment, repair his psyche, grow confident agency, and just be a badass lawman to do what he wanted to do to uh, be so confident that he could be innovative. So he was, he was the first to think of disguises, dressing up as a cowboy, a tramp, one time supposedly uh, a woman. And um, so he's an interesting character, he, he, he didn't want to resort to violence because he was a devout man, very, very Christian, had a very Christian upbringing, and he was wise. He knew probably, even though Isaac Parker was an open-minded judge and there were many open-minded people in the Fort Smith area, and they saw that 
they had a motivation too to have a black deputy marshal because they understood that Native Americans out in Oklahoma, for the most part, liked blacks better than whites. And he could use that to his advantage, getting information about where outlaws are hiding, et cetera. So, but he knew that probably would have a short life once he started killing all these white people or arresting them, prominent ones. So he wanted to shoot in self-defense whenever he could, he could do that. So that was, that, was, that was his code, kind of a Lone Ranger code, which is why Art Burton proposed, is this where the Lone Ranger myth or the, you know, the fictional character gets its inspiration He's the spitting image of Blue Duck, whom Bell Star had uh, a fling with. So it's, I'm proposing that there's, there's a reason why he doesn't look like his father, Cole Younger. Um, so anyway, um, any questions before I move on? I feel like I've talked a little bit. I thought I would give you a little bit of an introduction in case you didn't know much about them. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering how far off is this character? So he, he is light skinned. Um, he has freckles. So he's light enough where you, you can see his freckles. Probably very similar to Morgan Freeman. Um, now, supposedly, his father was African-American, his mother, too, we know, Perla Lee, who's buried in uh, Van Buren, and her grave is marked. Um, but we wonder, did his, is his master his father? whispered those thoughts. I mean, even am among the few historians that even know who he is, no one dares to say he was. But his, his first master was, was kind to him, as kind as a master could be, I suppose. Um, obviously not an idyllic situation, but as a slave, but he was a kinder master. Um, Harriet Jacobs talks about in, in incidents in the life of a, of a slave girl. I don't know if you've, you're familiar with that slave narrative, but she talked about her having, being fortunate enough to have a very kind, loving um, mistress that she worked for, and she she thought of her childhood as happy and. That meant so much to me when I, when I read that because I thought that really matched up for Bass Reeves, that this wasn't some white man fantasy, that this was possible. And I, I, I really think that's what Bass Reeves had, is a happy childhood, and he wasn't unhappy until he was given away the master gave him away to his son in 1862, during the Civil War because his son, a cavalry officer for the, the, the 11th Texas Regiment, was about to go off to war and he wanted his son to have Bass Reeves at, attend him as, as his body servant. And at this point, Bass Reeves was well known as a crack shot 
and a winner of turkey shoots and Indian Territory. His, his, his master would taught him how to shoot a gun and Bass Reeves proved Um, George Reeves has a history, had a history of being belligerent with his, with his superiors during the war. And when I read that, that, f that kind of gave me all I needed and what I suspected, why Bass Reeves times his decision to attempt to escape slavery after he's given away, not before. Something shifts in his personality. He's impatient for freedom. Why now? Why during the war? Why with George and not George's father, Stephen Reeves? I say all that to lead up to this excerpt I'd like to read from my first book, Follow the Angels, Follow the Doves, which covers his early life so that you can learn about enough about his background to see how he could become that now Hollywood is starting to embrace. If, if not in an historically accurate way, they're, they're, they're put, starting to put his name out um, and hire pretty glamorous African-American actors to play him. So, this, this excerpt from this occurs right after Bass Reeves learns that he's, gi he's given to his son. And the master ha has the, um, the plan that, okay, you two need to get along, get to know each other. Go out into the woods and hunt. Take a few days off, get to know each other on this hunt, and then... He's going to be your master. This hunt takes place in this area, and that's one reason why I want to read it. Um, I was thinking about my time in Fayetteville. This isn't set in Fayetteville, but I couldn't help. The setting is so close to here. I do want to give a caveat. I am sensitive to... Uh, to the sound and the, the legacy of the, the, the N-word. And since these books came out, I haven't read an excerpt with the N-word in it, deliberately. So why do I choose to abuse you? Oh, we're family. Come on. Uh, we can do that. We're family. Um, but seriously, I, I feel like... I'm afraid there's something that we're losing out of our education. It is part of history. It's an ugly part of history. And I believe the N-word is the most potent, complex word in the English language. And shouldn't brush it under the rug. We need to be sensitive and not use it to offend others. But in, the, in my book, I print it in dash dash. So I give, uh, give the reader the choice. You can supply the full word if you wish. You can brush over it if you don't even want to think of the word. But as a reader, it would be so anachronistic, take you out of, take you out of the 19th century if I say inward, inward. And Part of the education of the word is how white people used it as leverage to threaten, to show allegiance to other white people where they stand on the subject. And 
this conversation that takes place between Bass Reeves and his new master, George, the master is using it strategically to gain leverage because he's out in the woods with Bass Reeves, who was six foot two, big, strong, much taller than George Reeves. And so he's, he resorts to language to try to put his thumb on the, so he doesn't use his physical strength against him. So that's why I'm, so I hope you forgive me if, uh, if it offends you, I'm not being insensitive. Master Reeves spurred his Morgan from the stable in an unseemly manner, kicking up dust all over Bass and Strawberry, that's, that's his uh, horse, Bass's horse, which Master Reeves, the other Master Reeves, most certainly would not have done. Bass waited for the air to clear, then followed, loaded with the provisions and supplies, everything but the rifles. The sorrel was taller than the Morgan by three hands and made longer strides despite the added weight. So every so often, Master Reeves had to jog ahead a bit to stay out of the way. At every crossroad, some, Master Reeves would turn back in his saddle to see which direction Bass would point him in whether this way or yonder way, it would have been a whole lot easier, it seemed to Bass, if Master Reeves simply let him lead from the front. And when Master Reeves spoke, Bass could hear him better. Sometimes Bass said, yes, sir, Master, without a clue why. Not long after dawn, three white men appeared on horseback, creeping down a slope in their direction so slowly as if they were sitting on limbs of distant trees and not horses, as if the horses hauled a wagon each, but nothing of the such followed. One of the men, the smallest, but with the biggest hat and wearing a vest, asked Master Reeves where he was headed, where he was from. The questions of patrollers, not slave traders, and a posse would have shown a badge. They eyed Bass, but didn't speak to him. The padded sounds of breathing and feet tamping. A Negro man with shaggy gray hair, stooped and bloodied in tattered clothes, swayed on legs paled with mud. A rope bound the old man's arms to his chest and his chest to the saddle horn in the hands of the smallest man who did the talking 15 or so feet away. It wasn't his business to injure the old man's pride any further, being caught, a runaway with a bounty, but Bass allowed his eyes to trail back to the old man, and he caught sight of him looking back. Bass blinked, trying to make out his face if the old man was someone he knew. He blinked again, and the old man's eyes continued to shimmer in the scant light with prolonged helplessness as if he was just too tired to blink or simply saw no, no point to it. Flies lit on the old man's shoulders and lips, lit and unlit, a constant flourish. Bass averted his eyes straight ahead at the hindquarters of the Morgan and prayed the old man's master wouldn't abuse him any further simply because he was old and torn and broke looking from being dragged for miles. So how can I help you, gentlemen? Master Reeves said with a bluster. Bass realized he hadn't been the smallest patrol. The talker curled forward almost into a ball and squinted. You ain't one of them Kansas Jayhawkers, is you? His company laughed, but the talker remained quiet and still and rounded over. You got papers on yourn? Master Reeves snickered, and the two patrollers laughed again. I don't blame you for being suspicious, Master Reeves said. It's the best of times indeed, because you and I still wield the power of repression, the only lasting philosophy, regardless of what some John Bull like Charles Dickens desires to behold as true. Am I right? 
but it is, yes, the worst of times when niggers and upstanding citizens alike are stopped for paperwork. You bet, men. So please, allow me to dip in here, he said, moving cautiously to unbuckle a saddlebag and show you a few papers about my identity. Fuck the big nigger's identity. Let's talk about mine, gentlemen. Bass slipped his shoes from the stirrups in case he should need to drop down any moment. And for up, he didn't budge. Didn't need to plainly see that Master Reeves had produced a roll of papers, but instead of handing it over, he clutched it like a torch. The patrollers twitched, maybe to touch their guns, but not to raise or cock them yet. I'm George Robertson Reeves, a member of the Texas House of Representatives, Grayson County, and son of William Steele Reeves, retired member of not only the Tennessee House of Representatives, but also more recently, more pertinent to you, at least should be the Arkansas House of Representatives. Crawford County, and that man operates a little plantation down the road in Van Buren. Maybe you've heard of it, so go there if you wish. Reeves himself considers his slave Bass Reeves to be a fugitive. You know, the one he has given on loan to his son and is actually, lo and behold, accompanied by his very son, even as we speak and dispute. Or you can press your luck right now, gentlemen, if you so choose to delay me any further on my righteous action of taking said slave on a goddamn hunting expedition. This is a free country still, is it not? The main patroller stiffened in his saddle as if both to draw away from Master Reeves and to make himself appear taller. Free so long as we out here doing our part, he said. Just see to it you keep hitched what should be here. He tipped backward with his feet raised like a boy in a swing, then drove his heels down fast to spur his horse. The other two patrollers laughed with anticipation, twisting in their saddles to watch what their small friend was temporarily leaving behind. The rope whipped the air in the quick motion of hummingbirds, and Bass saw nothing else of the old man than this, just him taking flight, with his pale, muddied legs and the pale soles of his feet sailing and dissolving into the dust cloud of the horse, further hidden now by the two patrollers galloping to catch up. Later in the morning, hunters also passed them by on the road, they spoke to Master Reeves, but did not stop, and a stench of death trailed behind the muddied wagons piled with deer, hog, beaver, and bear like a long rope, thought Bass, that dragged the ground. Bass would have chosen to work for Master Reeves, the other Master Reeves, all his life over anybody else in this world. He had finally allowed himself to think that if freed, he would have chosen to live close to the plantation, to see his family, but also to still see Master Reeves come and go and even shoot with him if he wanted. But to be given away like a word. Eventually, every time, whether heated up, mad, or sad, he had to change the subject to no subject at all to the Morgan's shorter, softer stride, a constant catching up and falling behind over and over, just that, or the sun blooming off the Boston mountains like an oxide daisy, if God could be a daisy. And why couldn't he? God saying to Bass in his flower speak, don't forget, I don't forget. Petals fell into the tree cover and then they were there under it. Master Reeves and then Bass at the brow of the White River, sparkling like ice, where Bass had always come to pitch camp with Master Reeves, the other Master Reeves. The best campsite high enough above spring floods, yet near enough to them, the best hunting grounds for you name it. It'd be easier not to believe in God, 
believe bass? Not to believe in God, he could pull Master Eve's off his saddle right here, right now, right quick, and strangle him. Weigh him down in the river with easy as you please stones, then blaze his way northward for Kansas, shooting dead every white man who crossed eyes at him. All of that would be a whole lot easier than this, this fear in place of nothing. But wouldn't his mama and his auntie and grandmammy and granddaddy sugar be proud of him for the magic of keeping his fear buried deep and safe inside him like a tater? At the bank in a lacy patch of white pussy toes, Master Reeves dismounted and stretched himself as the Morgan blowing almost purring at the tiny, fuzzy-headed blooms nosed closer to the river for a drink. Bass walked strawberry close a little off into a tighter spot between tupelos and dismounted. Boy, what are you up to? Bass whipped his head in his direction, wondering what he could have done wrong. Master? Are you so fatigued by your own laziness that you think I'll stand by and let you nominate yourself master over me? No, Sir Master Reeves, I ain't tired, Bass said, not at all. Master Reeves took off his hat and wiped a kerchief across his forehead as he trod toward his boots sinking in softness. Then why are you planning yourself upriver of me? This my usual place, sir. Your usual place, is it? My father let you go north of him? Well, yes, sir, here he did. Master Eve smiled and balled the kerchief in his fist. The chick that sent him pecks the shell. Sir? Moby Dick, you haven't read it yet? He stared at Bass. He started to say more but paused with his jaw lowered, which made his mustache stand out darker and thicker and sharper, the ends angled down and together with the strip of hair growing from his bottom lip past his chin, Master Eves appeared to have a spearhead mounted on his face. The tip of it pointed to his nose as if to say he smelled the musk of everything, that he belonged to this forest. And then it vanished as he spoke. Nigger, you know what I'm asking you. Don't play dumb with me. Bass feared maybe he was dumb. He believed that if he said what was on his mind, he'd be answering a totally different question. Are you declaring allegiance to the north by going upstream of me? Oh, no, sir, Master, Bass said. I just don't cotton to no spot so thick with stick. Bass pointed to the pussy toes, like stepping on spider webs. Master Eves grinned. Bass, are you scared of spiders? A big nigger like you? No, sir, I ain't scared of no spiders, just don't cotton to no stick. I reckon you don't cotton to cotton then. No, sir, don't much cotton to no cotton. A lot of work, cotton, Master Eve said. Don't mind work, Master, Bass said. Don't mind work, huh? Then why are you lollygagging along, boy? Move your black ass downstream of me this very damn instant. And the circuit preacher came out to the plantation and gave a Sunday service in the quarters. Bass would stand in the back along a wall and listen with his eyes closed, nodding to the rhythm of what he heard, but that was all in the past now. Now his eyes were open and aimed at those pussy toes up under Master Reeves's boots. Don't be begging me. Are you having a conniption? You want the whip? Master Reeves, Bass repeated, not meaning to. Master Reeves laughed but wasn't happy. I may have to give you back. You think that's what you want, but it ain't what you want, boy. I promise you, you won't go back pretty. Master Reeves, Sir Bass said, still nodding, praying God smelled his fear and felt it, knotted up in his belly the way Bass felt it. He watched Master Reeves tuck his kerchief back in his pocket and set his hat back on his head. He watched him open his coat as if Master Reeves might have a whip tucked into his pants, but he didn't have anything of the kind. 
as if he was showing Bass he had nothing. But there was nothing to fear, nigger, so go ahead, as if Master Reeves finally smelled his fear too and was saying nothing to give him room to talk, as if he was waiting, praying too that this would end, that they could go on back to the peaceful world of earlier. So Bass nudged himself to go on and step up to the words, to go on and speak. I think, sir, he finally heard himself saying, I think I recall Master Reeves, the other Master Reeves, your, your daddy, sir, get on with it for heaven's sake. I remember him saying it flow backwards, the White River, sir, towards Northway, like the Nile do, like they was maybe the only two. Like the Nile? Master Reeves turned to the clear open space of the river and strode closer to it. He began to wonder if were seeing or even smelling. After standing there for so long at the edge, his back to bass, staring off at the wide road of silver water sliding slowly up. It's some world when a nigger ain't as free as an ant or a frog or a butterfly who can all find their way north to the Tupelos to get away from the stick of pussy toes without having to explain why or risk being whipped or dragged or sold or given away or killed. That was what Bass wished Master Reeves was thinking or seeing or smelling. Yep, Master Reeves said, turning to face Bass with a face surprisingly at ease, more like his father's than his own. That's a beautiful river. I've been away for too long. Let's enjoy this respite, Bass. My father is a wise man. Let's learn to trust each other, you and me, and have a high time on the fat of this land. Then when we get to Texas, you need not ever say, I think this and I think that in front of the other slaves, or I will splay you open like a clam. Oh, you'll be bleeding like a pig, but you'll look like a fucking clam. If you have thoughts, I recommend you pretend you don't. Master Bass said, suddenly flushed with exhaustion, he told himself to get used to this crazy man. He was crazy and always would be. You see, Master Eve said, my slaves know about Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's right. I read or recite to them sometimes to give them a glimpse into that vast realm of all they do not know. Do you, Bass, know about Ralph Waldo Emerson? Bass shook his head and lowered his eyes as Master Reeves inched his way from the river. He's a Massachusetts preacher and philosopher, an abolitionist. You know what an abolitionist is, don't you, Bass? Bass nodded. So far as a man thinks, free. What he says. Let that sink in. So far as a man thinks, he is free. So just by thinking, Bass, you make yourself free. Now, I can't keep you from thinking, not completely, but I can damn sure slow it down. And if you go around bragging about it, I'll have to take issue with you, understand? Understand, Master Bass said, and do you know what else Emerson says? No, sir, something about ice? Ice? What the fuck? Master Reeves, the other Master Reeves, your daddy, he buys his ice, he told me, from Master Chuchus. Master Reeves looked away and bared teeth as he lifted his top lip. No, you'll like this better than anything about ice because it's about you, boy, about all slaves. He's an abolitionist, my natural adversary, right? Oh, the fun of learning about what my adversaries believe. But he's your natural ally, remember? So it's important to you, too, what Emerson says, and he's about liberty by slaves, as most men are. He reached out and patted Bass on the arm, but hardly a hand, hardly any strength behind it, not the strength of God that Bass had behind his, his own. 
and something like that which made no sense could startle them. Most men are slaves because they have no thoughts or helpless, which is why we thinking men put y'all to work, Master Eve said. Well, you aren't helpless or thoughtless or you'd be working a field. So that makes you freer than a lot of white men who work fields. That's part of what he's saying. The other part is he wants you to stop crowing, boy. You don't need the North. They're tired too. You want liberty or more liberty than what you have? Then think more. He raised his hand up to Bass's head and with a fingertip drummed his temple, making Bass blink. Use your damn head more. This thing, he said, repeatedly drumming. But by God, Bass, you better keep that shit to yourself. You do that, and I'll let you be free. My gift to you. And I'll stop that section there. Um, so that's from the first book. Um, and then the next book skips from 1862 to 1884. And there are flashbacks and um, a little summary reflections to fill in the gap so you don't, you don't lose that continuous narrative thread. But I needed, that was the trickiest thing about writing this trilogy of figuring out where the narrative arc, where it would peak in each novel, um, and making some jumps were necessary to do that. Um, and the second book, he, he's at the peak of his career, as I said before, and one of the major plot lines is that he has to hunt down Jim Webb, whom Bass Reeves said was the bravest man he ever had to ha uh, deal with. And um, he has to deal with him twice. And this is according to the historical record. He arrests Jim Webb, and then he's, he skips out. He gets his bond covered, and anyway, he skips out, doesn't appear for his trial. So Bass has to go hunt him down again. So in that gap, I skipped over the first time he goes to get him, and he's hunting, having to hunt him down again. But then in a flashback, um, he, uh, I, tell you, I tell you the first account. So you, you don't lose any of it. Um, he has to track down these two brothers who lived, I don't think it really even requires any summary. I'm gonna start uh, at this excerpt just reading. It is a flashback, but you don't know it's a flashback. This is how the second book opens in 1883. To arrest Thomas and Wayne Coldiron in 1883, Bass Reeves had taken off on foot, leaving a small outfit of two men and two wagons behind at their camp on Corn Creek to continue south through the Choctaw Nation on a rickety cane and in tramp shoes, patched overalls, and a floppy felt hat as deep as a Lone Ranger could get, almost to Texas. I appreciate that. You got that little tip of the hat, Lone Ranger. Um, I'm not saying he he did inspire, but many good reasons why he could have. Or it doesn't really matter if he inspired the Lone Ranger character or not. He was the embodiment of the Lone Ranger in a discussion. Um, and this is this is according to all accounts. He walked 28 miles so that 
You talk about getting into character. Move over, Robert De Niro, 28 miles to a much confidence that he could walk up to where two murderers, bank robbers are hiding, that he believes are hiding, and think with his faith in God and his trust in his own skill that he can face anything and succeed. And that ultimately made me want to write this. I want to, that's not me, but I want to pretend for a moment I can think like that and or at least try to think quicker on my feet. Be, be as creative. Don't panic. Those are the great lessons of Bath Reeves, I think, for me. So that's why I started the book with this story. Ruth Coldiron was a widow with a green thumb who lived in a cabin on a parcel of bottom land between Blue River and Island Bayou. And due to these barriers, the homestead was impossible for a posse to reach without giving advance warning to the few residents of the area with only a single solid road leading to it. Two heathen sons, she supposedly lived alone. Midway between Corn Creek and the Cold Iron Home, Bass stopped for the night under a cluster of pines in a desolate forest and finished his meager provisions of salt pork and corn dodgers. He stroked his unwieldy mustache, splayed across his face like an old paintbrush. Not yet content with his disguise, he twisted the heels off his shoes and drew his colt, firing three times through the brim and crown of his hat. The moon was full that night, but distant, not bigger round than a 45 caliber entry, as if he'd made it himself. A full moon usually meant nothing more to Bass than what it was. He preferred to believe he was too Christian to be superstitious, but if the full moon was a distant one, he was sometimes reminded of his Van Buren home when he was a slave and happy child, not yet told what he was. Some nights, when his mother and the other slaves in the quarters had fallen asleep, if he knew the moon was full and low enough in the sky, He'd rise from his pallet on the floor and tiptoe past their beds to the front door and pull the plug of sackcloth out of the knothole to scope the moon. He'd then slowly back away and view the moon-filled knothole from the stitched stars of his quilt. And with the stars he could feel beneath his palms and naked legs, and with the moon he could see, it was as if he were outside with the night and older and on the prowl for outlaws as if he were a free and right man, as if he knew his life would come to this. His mother had buried a stillborn boy and a month-old girl in the shade of a mimosa behind the slave cabin. And all, when I think of mimosas, I always go back to Duncan. At Duncan Avenue? It's not street, is it? It is Avenue. And there was mimosas all, all around that house. Anyway. I was taken back to here when I read that. As soon as Bass had learned to walk, he learned to help her keep the graves of his older siblings tidy. He'd gather up the frail, fallen blossoms and fern-like leaves and twigs, and he'd sweep the dirt. Then, as if practicing signing his name, he'd draw crosses in the dirt with his finger. They spirits is with you, Bass, would tell him. You remember... You was always more than just one boy. He had asked once what their names were, and she told him they didn't have names and didn't need them. She smiled and bent to him as if to hug him because, she said, and swatted his bottom, you got yours. Whenever he thought about his older brother and sister, he thought about what he strove for, and it was for nothing less than to turn back evil more and more and not less and less to reverse the trends of man and the history of the world. If he could, and to call evil out for what it was, one slave at a time. He saw the slavery or potential slavery in all of them, the thieves, the whiskey peddlers, the rapists, the murderers. 
And they all needed freeing. Like Jacob in the Bible, Bass could outsmart and outfight whomever he needed and still be a righteous man. Or as good as Jacob was good. And if he had to lie and connive and disguise himself as Jacob had done in order to win his father's blessing over his elder brother Esau, grazed and though he'd get paid if he killed them either way he wanted each and every time to save them it was why he'd become a deputy in the first place because he believed in freedom so he followed in Jacob's footsteps because Jacob proved you didn't have to be that good to be good enough to turn back evil and win God's favor and forge your own nation, even while making a good living and providing for your family, because even though Jacob was bad, he wasn't too bad. And that was the key. I'm going to skip a little bit. Approaching twilight, a double colonnade of daffodils, touch me nots, and bearded irises beckoned him off the road and onto what must have been the right path. Ahead, azalea bushes and daylilies and more irises bloomed in thick clouds of color around the gray cabin and around the pig pen and outhouse, all pitched in a row on the edge of a wood. In flower boxes hanging below each cabin window grew tall pink and lavender and yellow tulips, like lollipops. It was no exaggeration of exhaustion when Bass tripped on the front step and stumbled up to the door. Leaning forward on his mud-tipped cane, flat-footed in his mud-caked shoes, he stretched his long arm out and knocked and called hello. The muslin curtains flickered in the window to his left just before the porch boards rippled beneath him from movement inside, just before the door opened. The woman behind him, I'm sorry, the woman reminded him of his own mother, with her graying black hair and strong square frame, faded flowered dress and thick bare feet. She was as unafraid of him as she could be, waiting patiently for him to speak. He removed his hat and crushed it to his heart, giving her a humble nod. Sorry to take you away from your family this evening, he said, but I'm real hungry, ma'am, and wondering if I could beg a bite to eat, just anything. Don't matter, a hog scrap will do, ma'am. He held her, she held her forearms across her chest and studied him down to his shoes. Where are you from? Trying to get back to Paris on nothing but a rickety cane and two blistered feet, ma'am. I've come a long way, and I'll be honest, the men of the law's after me. They hard on my trail for a trifle, even shot at me three times. I mean, close ones, see? He showed her the holes in his hat. I'll say, she said. Yes, ma'am, he said, setting his hat back on his head. Now, this is my first stop, so if I be putting you out any, I can try elsewhere. Nonsense, she said. You come on inside. I will gladly give you something to eat. Yes, ma'am, he said. Thank you, ma'am. He bent over to unlace his shoes, and the two sets of handcuffs had sewn on the other side of his underside of his overalls, Prince pressed against his ribs. He sucked in his gut to relieve the pressure on the stitches, and he inadvertently gasped. Be careful, she reached out to steady him. Yes, ma'am, thank you, ma'am, he said, rising up on his cane. Gingerly, he hauled his feet from his shoes. That's better. Good. Well, come on inside, she said, backing away to let him die. Just us tonight. You ain't interrupting nothing his left hand near his pocket where his colt was and with his cane in his right hand he lowered his head and stepped into a kitchen with a table and four empty chairs he looked elsewhere toward the hutch and basin toward the rocker and knitting stand then beyond the pot belly stove to two back rooms with doors standing open showing beds in the rooms but from what he could see in the scant light from the two front windows her sons were not here, and there didn't appear to be a rear entry door for escape. 
her sons were slippery to have been and to have never gotten caught. Glad to have the company, she said. She shut the door behind them. Yes, ma'am, me too, me too, been a while. She patted the back of her chair. Have yourself a seat. Thank you, he said. He hung his cane on the back of the chair and sat down. He watched her open a cupboard on the hutch and take out a covered plate. Her feet whisked across the sandy floor. Not much, I'm afraid, she said. She set the plate in front of him and pulled away the fabric of an old flour sack to reveal he couldn't believe his eyes, salt pork and corn dodgers. But help yourself, I done ate. No, this is more than generous. He didn't hesitate to collect a slice of pork and a corn dodger and pop them into his mouth. I got some mesquite jelly to help those dodgers go down if, if you like mesquite jelly. He was still chewing, unprepared to speak, so he waved her off. Well, you'll need something to make them go down. She returned from the cupboard with a glass and a demijohn hanging on her thumb. Don't get excited now because this is just water. Don't keep nothing harder. He shook his head and swallowed, much obliged, ma'am. He brushed his hands on his pants legs before reaching for the demijohn. He unstopped the cork and filled his glass. And ma'am, I don't want to alarm you if you was to see this here sidearm peeking out my pocket. He plugged the cork back in the demijohn and withdrew his colt, laying it on the table. You can hold on to it until I go if you like. Up to you. She smiled with a nod. I appreciate that. I'm Jacob, by the way. He tipped the brim of his hat and his thumb slipped through one of the bullet holes. She noticed and snickered. And I'm Mama, she said. Everybody calls me Mama. Yes, ma'am, he said. Nice to meet you. He reached for another corn dodger, and Mama reached for his colt, taking it by the barrel and walking away into the bedroom on the left. He didn't expect that. Behind the, her door, he heard only her, her sandy feet start and stop, start and stop. He drank his glass of water and refilled the glass. She returned and sat across the table. An unlit oil lamp and a box of matches sat on a doily between them. He smiled and sandwiched a slice of pork between two corn dodgers. You know, she said, I've got two boys, and they're always wanted by the law, being pursued by the law. He nodded. Law's getting tougher and tougher these days. I tried to tell my husband this weren't no place to raise them boys, free land or not but he wouldn't listen. She rested her chin in her hand and looked off toward one of the windows as if from that distance she could see anything more than the light of dusk through the swirls of the hand-blown glass. I blame the place more than them boys. Boys will be boys, you know. She cut her eyes at him. You know, don't you? Unfortunately, ma'am. Well, glad to help. I appreciate it, he said. Soon as you're done, we got a creek out back. It'll do you good for them blisters to get a quick dip. Yes, ma'am, he said. I know I must be right. Well, that too. She wrapped her knuckles on the tabletop, then stepped away. Bass gave the cabin another once-over, registering the location of and distance between doors and possible weapons in case later in the dark he needed a stove log or a knitting needle or to dash from room to room or find his way outside because he considered it now a good sign Mrs. Coldiron had taken his pistol. Apparently, she was allowing him to stay the night. When she returned from her bedroom with a bath towel and a half-melted bar of lye, he'd cleared his plate and was brushing crumbs out of his mustache. Here, she said, soap and draping the towel over his arm, take the path by the outhouse, straight back. He smiled, reached for his cane, and slowly stood up. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, mama. That's right, she said. She reached for the matches. Better hurry. The path by the outhouse led him through mesquite, cedars, and cypress to a sandbank freshly marked by horses. He lowered to his haunches. There were two sets, one shod and one not, upstream and down, the creek widened and darkened, 
but the passage for a horse here at the bend would be an easy leap. He held his breath and listened for hoof stamps or whinnies and blows from horses, maybe tied to a tree somewhere out of sight. When he heard nothing but a breeze rattling the high boughs and closer, a trickle of water dripping from the wings of a goldfinch, he decided to relax and undress and jump in. Of course, his dip would be quick. This water was as cold as Corn Creek. He froze going under, even as he thrashed, his heart and mind and nerves all wired up and electric as Thomas Edison's famous bull. Um, the scene continues on, but I don't want to overstay my welcome. Um, Do you have any more questions for about me, uh, about Bass Reeves, anything at all? I'm open. You can ask anything. Uh, I know that his the location of his graves was kind of lost. You know, went into oblivion for a long time, and um, he laid there for years before people really began to look at him. I, I guess his life kind of phased out at the end about a lot of publicity. And, and what makes them think that the grave in Muskogee is his grave, and is there an official marker there? Because if they haven't really truly identified it, I wouldn't think there would be. There's, there's, there's not a, a marker, and oh, there it is. Okay. Um, Art Burton had. Uh, reasons to believe that this was the most logical site. Um, and because of he was living in Muskogee at the time, this is where black residents were buried at the time. And he was, because of his success as a lawman, and it was a money racket if you could survive it. Because as a lawman, he got to collect the bounties that were offered. The, the two brothers that he goes after, there was a bounty of $5,000 in 1883. So there was money to be made. He was wealthy. He had a nice house in, in Van Buren. Um, on, if you're familiar with Van Buren on um, Vine and Second, Preface the biggest mistake in his life with his some of his greatest successes. The Cold Iron Brothers and Jim Webb, the, the character I mentioned earlier that he has to track down a second time. Uh, maybe out of fatigue from all of what he's doing, uh, maybe there's a little vanity, a little hubris there too. Uh, he makes a mistake, and there, there's debate about what happened. If you've been to Fort Smith and you've, you've watched the, the drama play out on, in person or video of the testimony of his murder trial, he, Bass Reeves kills his cook. Is it murder? Is it an accident? Is it something in between? So no easy answers here. He was charged with murder. And Bass Reeves thought, well, I've been making a lot of money for something. And he spent his wealth defending himself. I'll, um, Peyton Manning is going, going into the Hall of Fame next year. I was watching in the hotel room this morning. I'm watching. Uh, how people, you know, from Canton, Ohio, come, approach him, hey, big news, you know, you're going to the Hall of Fame. I just think how strategic of a quarterback or war general 
Bass Reeves could be at times. He hires up all of the good attorneys in Fort Smith to defend him and, and leaves the court with no Now that is brilliant. He spent his wealth. Um, and so that's what this book is about, partly. And then I finish that story. You gotta have a little bit of a cliffhanger. In the third book, and I complete the what happens with the trial in the third book, I'm writing it now. And later in his life, he, he does suffer some to, to his reputation. Because of the charge of murder, some people just want it firmly believed he was guilty, he got off with his connections. I mean, he was good friends with the judge, Isaac Parker. So some people just wanted to believe he was crooked. And um, um, that's, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but when he dies, not everybody thought of him as this wonderful lawman um, and wanted to recognize him. So more and more white people were migrating from the Northeast into the area and they were bringing their racism and they weren't used to living among Native Americans and African Americans. Uh, so he, toward the end of his life, he kind of suffers more, more racism than he did in the beginning when he was given, given the job of a deputy marshal. Um, but I, that's all the information I can tell you. And I, I hope Art Burton will uh, maybe shed more light on this, maybe when he learns it. Yes. Hmm? There are. There, he has a, uh, a great nephew who he's retired now, late in life, and he served as a judge and, and wrote a book that includes some family stories. And he, he repeats a lot of information that we, we know, you know, basic information. Well, some information. So much of it conflicts with the historical record that I don't know what is true in that book. And uh, so anyway, that's all I'll say about that. I don't want to disparage the man of the book, but uh, like he says, Bass Reeves born in Texas, and we know he wasn't born in Texas, and a lot, a lot of things that are just seem erroneous, so I, I don't know. There are a couple, a couple of moments there that in the book that that might shed light on on his character, like family stories that that weren't as twisted as other things that he says, but I, I don't know. Yes, you want? So you're um, from the area, and I mean I'm going to assume that you're sticking as close to the history of, of the man as possible. Are you sticking close to the history of the area? Like you talk about the plants and the water being cold. Have you done that? Absolutely. Uh, so every every plant, you know, tree. I make sure that it's indigenous to the area, and I I want to keep the fiction interesting as much as possible. I, I try to find interest interesting ones like pussy toes, you know, or something that is just a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, I always have to check the Oxford English Dictionary for, for the, so was this word used at this time? Could it have been used? Um, that's, that's why I've been working on this project for almost 11 years now, because I didn't know how, I, I was really naive in the, in the beginning. I didn't know how hard it was to write historical fiction. I, I don't know if I would have, would have started this if I'd known, all right, so my work would come out, and I'm glad it's out. I, you know, I haven't always been successful. I, I've got a couple in the closet. 
but it, it, one rabbit hole leads to another. Absolutely. Native Americans, all right, so I've got a, uh, I've got a Choc Choctaw character in the story. Um, I can't have him not speak when I'm quoting other characters. I gotta learn Choctaw. So what, what, how would this be said in Choctaw? Lord, it just never ends. <laughs> I, and I wanna, re, I wanna honor them. I don't wanna leave the Native Americans out. I didn't wanna leave, that's part of the, and if you're wondering why is this white man writing about, and I've gotten this before, so I mean, if you, if you have thought it, I guess I thought it, so hell white guy writing about this black man it's like well you tell me who has the authority to write about uh, pre-civil war days early frontier who's a Native American and an African American and a slave and a cavalry officer Who's all these people? I mean, this is American history. N nobody is an authority on all these people and all this history on the plants and trees and the language and on and on and on. So I guess I have a big, a big enough ego. I guess, you know, I've got hubris that matches Bass Reeves that I would want to take this on in a way. I thought, here's a story that needs to be told and maybe I can tell it. Maybe I should tell it if, if I want to tell it. I mean, his story's been out for over 100 years, and no one's attempted. So do I, as a privileged white man, decide, you know what, I'm going to ignore this black man's history? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that, is that privilege? I don't know. It, I just think we live in an odd world. How we we twist some things, and but anyway, I'm, I'm sounding like I'm defending myself, but I'm trying to really just share my thought process of. All right, one thing I can do to, to show. Maybe, I have a little legitimacy. Is. At the time when I started thinking about this, I heard Morgan Freeman. I was already thinking about. Should I go back to school? I was proud of, I, I was stubborn. I was proud of my terminal degree here from the University of Arkansas. Uh, I, I, I was a student among gods. You know, I think about things that Jim Whitehead and Bill Harrison and Skip Hayes said in class, I, you know, through all these years. But, how can I really gain enough agency, be sensitive enough, knowledgeable enough? Maybe I should get the PhD in African American narratives and do my best to be able to write this story. So I'm, I'm giving it my best. If it's not good enough, I apologize, but I, I did my best. Yes. Historical fiction. Can you talk a little bit about how you keep up with your notes, particularly your factual elements that you incorporate into your fiction? I read them over and over and over again because I don't have a photogenic mind like <laughs> Skip's wife, Patty. Um, so I'm constantly rereading. My notes, um, various articles, books, and I try to write when I know I have a long enough period where I can, on a daily basis, stay in it so it doesn't leave me because once I leave it for a couple of months, like in a semester when I'm teaching, boy, it's hard to find that place again. And, and then it's like, I got to read everything again. I got to get back into that place. I got to read what I wrote first, and then I've got to read what, you know, and put myself there again. It takes a while. Um, historical fiction's pr pretty difficult, but it's been a, a real pleasure. I feel like I've learned so much about 
uh, not just Bass Reeves, but American history, and it's, it's been fun. But I had no idea I was going to write three books, so I, I thought at first it would be one. Um, yes? Did, did Bass's wife and any other family members uh, come into possession of any of his letters, journals, writings, whatever, articles? Because there, uh, there are people that say he was marginally, marginally literate, but he served in the military. And, uh, you said marginally? Literate? Literate. He, he was illiterate. So as, as, a, as a lawman, he always had a right-hand man, a posseman, who would read the writs or the subpoenas and go over, show him, show him what the name looked like and read the charges, and, and Bass would memorize. And supposedly, supposedly, only one time did Bass get it wrong when, when he, so like at a campfire, when it had some downtime, you know, he would study the look of the names. And whether his posse man was there or not, sometimes not, he would uh, arrest somebody and be able to flip through, find the right, find the right one. Uh, one time he made a mistake, it, it, which embarrassed him. Um, but from, from what I've read, uh, that he, he, he was illiterate and he, if he ever signed anything, it was with an X. So if you see any paperwork, court documents, signed Bass Reeves, that's not, that's not his hand. That's some clerks. And it, I know of nothing that the family saved. Um, there's a there's a pistol, a Colt at the whenever. Let's see, it, it's at the courthouse in Fort in Fort Smith, and I got another couple of pieces. Um, they're going to be in the Marshall's Museum whenever that opens. That are supposedly his. I'm friends with Art Burton, and he um, because. I wanted to befriend him. I thought he knows more than anybody. He, he's heard about Bass Reeves as, since he was a child growing up in Oklahoma. So um, he has his doubts that, that those, you know, the gun that's going to be displayed was actually his. But because there are people that come out of the woodwork and they want to be a part of the news. Oh, this was his. Well, are you sure? Maybe maybe you believe it true, but maybe it's not true. Maybe you don't believe it. I, who knows? Any other? Go ahead. Um, can you expound a little bit on on the fact that he had to arrest his own son for murder? Okay, so you're making me divulge that. All right, so that's going to be in the <laughs> third book. That and that's that's how that's how he redeems himself after the murder trial. I mean. Um, his son kills his wife when he finds her with another man. And it's not the first time. It was the last time. And he didn't kill the fellow. He beat him up, but he killed his wife and took off. And Nobody volunteered, to, and this is, at, this is when um, Bass and his son, were they were living in Muskogee. And nobody wanted to volunteer, no, the marshal or any, none of the deputies wanted to go after Bass Reeves, his son. Um, and when he learns about it, he says he'll do it. So he goes and within a couple of weeks, tracks him down, brings him in, talks him into doing what's right and just giving up, you know, and I'll, I'll do my best to make sure you're treated fairly, you know, in the courts. And he went to Leavenworth, his son, Benjamin or Benny, Benjamin Reeves, and uh, he looked very much like Bass Reeves, like skin.
went to Leavenworth, Kansas, and he, he, he was eventually paroled because of his good behavior in prison and never committed another crime. Any other questions? All right. You've been captive audience. I really appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you very much.